Good evening, good evening, good evening, family. Good evening, good evening. My name is Aaliyah Berry. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Sidewalk Talk. This is episode five from season two. So we are halfway through season two. Season one of Sidewalk Talk was dynamic, and we are coming to Netflix soon. I know I say that every time, but you just wait. You just you just wait so you can see Sidewalk Talk on Netflix, family. <laughs> so what is Sidewalk Talk? If this is your first time tuning into Sidewalk Talk, it's an online platform where we have real talk about the streets of North New Jersey to gain insight, to clarify misconceptions, and to get a call to action from frontline workers, right? That is our mission here on Sidewalk Talk. So we gain insight by having nuanced conversations, right? Conversations that aren't just black and white, conversations that are very complicated, conversations that are not just simple and are often oversimplified, right? We unpack some of those nuanced conversations and we talk about truths that are not often being discussed for whatever reason, right? We also look to clarify misconceptions, specifically clarify misconceptions in general, but also about groups of people who are often unheard. And then when they are heard, they're misunderstood based on assumptions about their lives. We clarify a lot of misconceptions here on Sidewalk Talk, right? And then we also want to lift up the work of local organizations and or frontline workers to get a call to action. Call to action because as I say every Sidewalk Talk episode, no offense to emails and meetings, family, but it's action time. It's action time. We're All these meetings about action, we, we need to move towards the action, right? So Sidewalk Talk is really about action and discussing action, um, but not only discussing it, but also getting these calls to action by frontline workers and ones that are here on the ground, boots on the ground, here in the mighty North New Jersey, doing mighty unprecedented revolutionary work in this community for them to give us a call to action um, so that we may move forward the Way we need to move forward right so that is what we're, we seek to do here on sidewalk talk um and again this is season two so we have done 15 episodes already um and so yeah so if you do not uh know me my name is Aliyah berry and i'm your host on tonight so um let me take this opportunity to introduce myself right so i am a licensed clinician i have 20 years experience working with ages zero to 60 in a variety of settings. So I've been in daycares and group homes and shelters and schools, um, you know, correctional facilities. I've been in a whole bunch of different settings working with a variety of different individuals. Um, so I'm a community-based social worker. And so what that means to me, community-based, community-based is a lifestyle, okay? Those of you who are watching who know this work that we're about to talk about today, it's a lifestyle. It is not a nine to five. It is not within the four walls of an agency, right? It is um, definitely a lifestyle, right? So for me, that often means that I find myself in baby showers and graduations, unfortunately, at sentencing hearings and funerals, um, goal setting literally on the sidewalk and getting hugs at a red light. So that is the community-based social work and how um, that works for me. I also have um, a special focus on serving and supporting individuals before, during, and after incarceration, which we will talk about in more detail for this topic today. So I currently work as a consultant with Seeds and Berries, um, and I do program development, training, and direct clinical services in schools, nonprofits, and the government sector. So you can follow Seeds and Berries on Facebook, on Instagram, myself, Aliyah Berry, on LinkedIn. Um, you can also find out more about my services um, on my website, seasonberries.com. And then the prior episodes of Sidewalk Talk right? So you can go to the YouTube channel um, that, at Seeds and Berries, um, and you can see the first 10 episodes of season one, as well as the four episodes. This is the fifth one of season two. Um, and so we've had a lot of dynamic guests. We've had a lot of powerhouses across the city of Newark come to Sidewalk Talk and speak as experts on the topics that we have um, that we have discussed already. So definitely check out that YouTube channel. Um, so that is enough about me. I wanna just quickly get into um, some brief housekeeping, right? So some brief housekeeping to like, tag, and share this broadcast for impact. 
right? So first of all, to like and love and laugh and like do all those different kinds of reactions, it just helps me and my guests feel like we're not alone in a room, <laughs> right? It just helps us know that like people are engaged and how they're feeling about the conversation that we're having. So definitely, thank you. So I see I see the little thumbs up. I see the thumbs up. So yes, that's just a way to engage um, and, you know, kind of participate without really participating if you if you don't want to, right? Um, but also to tag. So as you hear the conversation go forth, if there's someone that you feel would enjoy this conversation or would benefit from this conversation, then feel free to tag them in the comments and then they'll get a notification on their end to come in, and so then they can join the conversation as well. Um, and so then also share for impact. Now, keywords for impact. The share is not for popularity, okay? My guests nor I care about popularity. This is for impact because we do feel we have an important message on tonight, a very important message on tonight, and so we wanted to be able to go near and far and to get into the hands um, that we feel need it. And so definitely feel free to share for impact. The last piece is to comment. Okay, definitely comment like this is a live broadcast. And so there are many people that are watching right now that do you also have expertise in this area, right? Like there's a lot of community members that are in lanes doing work or doing work from the sidewalk to your living room right? And everywhere in between. Um, but definitely do uh, comment, C bring your expertise, contribute your expertise to the conversation. My guests and I would love to hear your wisdom. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to throw those in the comments. Um, but again, just try to engage with us. Um, so we feel, you know, we're not in a, in a room by ourselves. All right, family. So that's my light housekeeping, like tag and share for impact. And then also comment to add value to the conversation. Okay, so we're going to get into this. We are going to get into this Sidewalk Talk episode. I am so ex I'm excited about all my episodes, but I'm super excited about this particular episode. Um, it is also very timely. Um, so I will just say that the way I kind of match topics to guests, right, is I think about a topic way ahead of time, by the way. Like these things are done way ahead of time. But I think about a topic and then I go through my mental community Rolodex, right? And then I select someone who I feel is an expert on that particular topic. It is not the other way around. So we are not guests and then find a topic to match them. No, it's topic, find an expert to speak on that topic. So the folks that have sat at this table, one, I take very seriously, and two, um, they're experts. They are definitely experts in the field. We are not about to patty cake on, <laughs> on this topic nor any of the other topics we've had thus far, okay? So today's topic is achieving community safety through street-based strategy. Achieving community safety through street-based strategy. That's a heavy topic, y'all. That's a heavy topic on tonight. That's a heavy topic on tonight. But the guest that I have to discuss this topic here is none other than Solomon Middleton Williams, who is a public safety professional. He's a public safety professional, which he's going to kind of get into, like, exactly what that means and where did that title even come from. And, and title, do we serve with or without a title? I'm just, well, look, we can, <laughs> we can start it already, right? But he's going to explain that title a little bit more. Um, and he is, I've worked with him for, you know, quite some time and know that it, when it's boots on the ground, it's boots on the ground. It's sincere, it's genuine. Um, his love for the community is sincere and genuine. And so he is the perfect person to talk to us about this tonight, whether you already do this work and we're preaching to the choir right? Which I would consider myself a choir member. However, I'm in class family. I'm about to ask Solomon some questions that I need answers to, even though I do the work, right? So if you're watching and you already do the work, you still may be in class. And number two, if you don't do this work and you're trying to learn and be convinced about this whole achieving safety myself in, you know, street-based strategy, what's that? What's that? What do you mean by that? Well, Solomon and I are going to try to convince you on tonight, all right? So, Perfect expert on this topic, and we're going to get straight into it, and he will tell you more about himself. Let's go. 
Hello, Solomon. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Leah. Thank you for having me here tonight. Really excited about this conversation. Yes, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Um, you are the perfect person to have this conversation with. And so I'm super excited that you're here and we're about to have this conversation. So I know you, um, I did the best, you know, introduced what I know, but I would like you to introduce yourself to the audience, um, how you see fit and how you were planning to come tonight. Yeah, so thank you. So this is like really crazy because I saw your first episode ever of uh, uh, Sidewalk Talks, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, and so to be here today is, is an honor, and I appreciate you so much again for having me. Uh, again, my, my name is Solomon Middleton Williams. Uh, I am a Newark resident. I was born here in the city of, of Newark, and I, I was raised here in the city of Newark, uh, uh, most of my life, I spent about 12 years in Seth Borton projects. But prior to that, uh, I have a story that's really similar to a lot of New Yorkers. Um, when we when we look at the the landscape of safety and wellness, um, my mom and my father both uh, were they were addicted to substances. Um, we were lost in a shuffle, and we were sent away to foster care. Um, and I landed right here. What I believe is is the greatest war, the South War, and into Seth Borton projects, um, and so uh, I spent time there. And um, what I learned in in that neighborhood is that people really care about each other. Um, but what happened in my neighborhood was um, was over policing, under investment, um, and that then created what we know as like violence. Um, and and we saw death and we saw um, families being separated. And so uh, I had a chance to experience that for 12 years of my life. And what I what I couldn't understand is why in this neighborhood was all this stuff happening? You know, we're talking about, uh, you know, some of the most horrendous stuff that I've ever seen, you know, seeing cops kill um, a young man named Ibn um, a, a year before he was murdered by law enforcement. He lost his mom to an overdose, and the night that he was murdered, he was screaming how much he wanted his mom and how much he missed his mother. Um, and our response as the city of Newark, we 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 gave him a service that was a disservice to the entire community um, when we took his life. And so, um, you know, that really drives me to doing the work that I do today. Um, I, I honor Ibn. I honor um, I honor people like Hassan and Nico, um, and and you know, I'm excited about this conversation because um, if it wasn't for like this conversation that I had um, with the former elected official here in the city of Newark, I probably wouldn't be here today, right? I asked a, a former elected, I said, hey, you know, I spent 12 years in my neighborhood and there was all this violence and chaos and people needed help. You know, why didn't you intervene, you know? And the, the representative response was, you know, there was too much money being made in my neighborhood. And when I looked around, Aaliyah, I couldn't see the money in my neighborhood, right? I didn't see money being made, right? Um, but in retrospect, right, what I really, what he really meant to say uh, was that there was entities, there were systems that were making money um, as people in my community was losing their lives and families were being separated and no one was getting help. And so um, that drives me today. Um, that's kind of how I got here, having a conversation with you today, right? I left Newark at 18, uh, didn't really have a place to go, traveled, learned new things, um, and people were really gracious in giving me opportunities. So when I came back to Newark, I wanted to make sure that I give young Black men, young Black girls an opportunity that was given to me. And so I fight on behalf of the people of Newark. Uh, I fight on behalf of the most marginalized people, uh, people who are hurting. And so um, I do want to say, right, a lot of people may know me from my, my nine to five, right? Uh, or, or as my wife would say, my 24-7, uh, my job uh, as the deputy director for the Newark Community Street Team. Uh, but today I'm really here representing what it means to be a Newark resident first. And so my responses today will be coming sincerely from my heart, right, as a Newark resident, um, as a father, as a husband, right, and as a community member. So thanks, Lee. 
So thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and, you know, it's so true, even in those moments, the 24 seven, right. And the 24 seven, you know, as I said, in the introduction, like this thing is a lifestyle, this is not a nine to five. And it's definitely a lifestyle as Ali, our former guest said, you know, literally no days off. Right. And, um, and so, but we carry, we carry who and what we carry that continues to drive us. Um, so I honor what you carry that drives you. Um, and I honor what we all carry that continues to drive us. So thank you. Um, thank yeah. you for being here. Yes. So, yeah. So this topic, right. Achieving community safety through street based strategy, right. You know, how, well, I, I don't even want to get ahead of myself, right? Let's break it down, though. Let's break it down because um, through my conversation with E, right, Policy Director of North Community Street Team in the last episode. So the last episode with E, we did um, policy. We talked about policy. We talked about survivor work. We talked about the history of this movement, like California in the 90s. Like, it was a really dope class session <laughs> as well. Like, I was definitely taking notes, right? And, um, and so with your pre-meeting and hers as well, how we're defining safety, is something that I think we need to start off with from jump because I don't know if everybody's working with the same working definition. So like, how do you define safety? And then this fancy, fancy, trend setting, fancy word, community-based public safety. How are mm -hmm. we defining that? Let's let's get on the same page with these definitions. Yeah, I think, Ali, I think that's a great question, right? So if you were to ask me like five years ago, what mm -hmm. safety looked like, because uh, I didn't know. I would have said like safety looks like police officers. Mm -hmm. It looked like police interventions. It looked like police presence. It looked like arresting the bad guys and mm -hmm. sending them to jail and then going to prison uh, and never coming back, right? Um, but I had to learn, right, what safety really meant. and you know, the teaching that we get, it says that safety is not the absence of violence, right? It's not the absence of violence, but it's a sense of someone's well-being and the infrastructure that supports their healing journey. And so, like... Wait, say that one more time. Say that one more time for the people in the back. Say it one more yeah, time. Yeah, for the people in the Break back, it. right? For overflow, for overflow, like safety <laughs> overflow. is not... Right, safety is not the absence of violence, right? It's the presence of, of a person's well-being and the infrastructure that supports their healing journey. Mm. So if you was to ask me again, like five years ago, I would have been like, yeah, lock them up, lock them up, you know? Um, but today I sent, I sit here as an educated man, right? Around what safety really looks like. And so safety can look different in different neighborhoods, right? Here in the city of Newark, it can look different. You know, I was on a meeting last month, right? And we had, you know, this neighborhood, they were like, we want safety in our neighborhoods. But their safety was what? Police presence, cameras everywhere. That was their sense of safety, mm -hmm. right? And their well-being. And there were people on the call who were like, yeah, we're going to make that happen for you, right? But if we take, like, say, a neighborhood where I'm from, Seth Boy Projects, right? And where it currently is since vacant uh, on Dayton Street in Evergreen, if you ask, you know, the neighbors, like, what safety looks like, they're going to tell you, listen, we need to get these young men off the street, right? And like, well, where are they going to go? Well, we need to get them adequate training and education and resources, not incarceration. Because once we start doing the lock them up, jail to prison, we are continuing a cycle, one of violence, right? Structural violence. And then we are continuing a cycle of poverty, right? Generational poverty. So the, the people here on, on Evergreen Street are saying, look, this is what we really want, right? We want to create um, generational opportunities that's going to create generational wealth. So normally we're like, we want to make generational wealth. We want to, in order for our neighborhoods to be safe, we need to have generational opportunities so that folks can be feeling safe. And so safety looks different in different neighborhoods, right? Uh, but we must support what that neighborhood safety looks like in any by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I would just say, even though we'll probably, I, I, I foresee this being a theme throughout tonight's conversation, um, but asking and listening 
Mm-hmm. To then, right? So I, mean, I see your face because we're going to get into that. But I'm just, I'm wetting the palate for folks because how could you possibly know what safety looks like in a particular community unless you ask and then be quiet long enough to hear and listen, hear and listen, and, and, right? So, um, you know, so thank you for that. And let's get, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is like, this is the this is like uh, social work, so, social pro, social service providers failure, right? That they're like, listen, we came into your neighborhood and we provided you with all these resources. And my question is always, did you do a needs assessment with the people who live right. within those communities? Right. Right. Don't blanket the entire South Ward. Don't blanket the entire West Ward, which I'm pointing out the South and the West Ward, because these are the most uh, disadvantaged communities, neighborhoods, like wards within our city, right? Like, don't tell us what we need. Don't come out with jobs and say, hey, let me, let me get a quick story. Let me get a quick story, right? When I came back home to Newark, right? I, again, I traveled a lot, right? I've been in a lot of places. I came back home three years ago and I started working at a school and uh, I decided to quit my job, right? My wife was like, what are you doing? And I said, I cannot, I cannot do it, right? I had people calling me like, listen, my name was on that, ref- that reference. And I'm like, listen, I understand, but I couldn't do it. And so I took the journey of a Newarker, right? Like I quit my job, I had some money in the savings and I went down to where? Unemployment, right? I went down there and they were like, uh, Negro, they looked at my resume, they said, Negro, stop playing with me. And they put it down they said, go get a job at Macy's. They hiring $9.25 an hour. <clears throat> I said, did you look at my resume, right? And they're like, but go get a job at Macy's. And this is what happens. Like they come, you know, uh, social service providers come into our neighborhoods whoever they may be, and they assume this is what we need. But in reality, we need to really have a deep conversation, sidewalk conversations with these young men and women to see what they really need so that they can thrive. And I think we do a disservice by saying we're going to pour resources into communities without actually doing a needs assessment with the people. Yes. Yes. And then let me even take it a step further. Solomon. You know how we get to go in Solomon, right? But because today we're not only so you know when when I when we promoted this this episode here we are talking to providers yes but we are also talking to teachers store owners activists right and and all of but the entire village also includes parents grandparents right and so when it comes to listening to what you need help with a young person told me recently, like people keep telling me how they want to help me. And, right, and, right. and he was not talking about providers, to be clear, right? And I just want to put that out there that like the listening, the listening piece, I'm just going to keep bringing that up all night tonight because it's from providers all the way to grandma in the kitchen is it, not listening to me. You know what I mean? So how then, right, with the trend, we're taking one step further with this definition, this whole community-based public safety. Now, you had said five years ago, I would have said blah, 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 right? And that's because you were in your journey of transformation. Everybody's yes. continuing in that journey of transformation. And I'm about to transform just from this conversation, right? Um, but the community-based public safety is a buzzword, Solomon. And we talked about in former episodes just not checking off boxes. We're not trying to just check off boxes to say we did that. Right. Mm -hmm. How would you define community based public safety? And let's lay that foundation as we go forth in this conversation. Yeah. So I'm going to just just backtrack real quick. So there is this idea of like community based public safety. Right. In the past, growing up. Right. Again, from Newark South War, I've seen organizations come up and said that they were like, um, like, you know, community based organizations. We've seen these like waves. They're like, hey, we're coming to stop the violence. Like that's our primary goal is like stop the violence. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the past, you you heard like words like, oh, um, it's just a hug a thug program. Um, a what? They're to, a hug a thug. You know, we want to put our hands around the thugs and hug them and so they won't do any more violence, right? Um, or uh, these are uh, gang interventionists. You know, they mediate all the conflicts of gang members, right? Or, or even like the most popular word like uh, credible messengers, right? I'm like, okay, you know, that's cool. But that stuff, puts uh, people in a, like in a box, right? And so we're saying, look, we are community-based public safety, meaning that we are in the community, we're from the community, um, and we are providing safety for the community. That's what we're doing. And so 
my title, when you look at the screen, it says public safety professional. That's what we are because we we view safety, right? As law enforcement being a public safety professional, EMS, you know, hospitals being public safety professionals, but we never give that title to the community members who are out there doing the work. Why not? Why do we have to keep, you know, giving cliche words, right? To justify people's work. These folks are out there, you know, every day doing community work and saving lives. Why can they not have the title as public safety professionals? And so the community based, you know, public safety is really the work of the community, uh, rooted within the community, servicing and keeping our communities safe. That's the, the premises of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. And, and again, especially like to give, as you said, like, if you didn't use these words exactly, but they, the everyday resident, right? Like, th they don't necessarily have to work for an agency, and we're drilling that home today, family. We're, me and Solomon are drilling that home today. Like, we don't have to work for an agency, nine to five, be a social worker, have any type of degree or letter or nothing. <laughs> like, this is, like... We're talking about everyone. We are talking about every single corner, every single person included in the village. That's who we're talking about today and to today. But I can appreciate you talking about that title that seems to be exclusive. And like you said, why? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. My question to you then, Solomon, though, is, do we, like, why or do you agree that folks feel they need a title to work. Where, been, where are we at been, with that, been, Solomon? What do you think? Been, where are we at with we've that? We've been taught that, Aaliyah. You know, we've been taught that, like, in order to, uh, like, in order to do certain things, you have to have a title. In community-based public safety, right, you don't need a degree to do the work. It is it is, it is wonderful if you have one, right? It gives you, like, Sometimes. hopefully the stories of, you know. Sometimes not, okay. <laughs> right? But you really, you don't need it. And here's, here's the thing, uh, Leah, people don't know this, but this is a career path, right? This is a career path for 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 Jaheem on a corner, right? For Shaniqua on a corner, right? This is a career path. And um, we have to promote community-based public safety because every young person or every old person or old head, as we call them, right? Mm -hmm. um, every auntie and every poppy and every uncle, right? They can get into this work with life experiences, right? Because they know like they want to provide safety in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how to. Mm -hmm. And when you step into the work of community-based public safety, you learn, right, how to provide safety without a title, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. There are um, 30 people in the city right now who are doing safe passage. They're doing safe passage, making sure kids go to school safely and come home, right? These these folks ain't got no title, right? It, they, they're called outreach workers, but they are out there every day making sure kids go home safely and go to school safely, right? They're providing safety not only for the students, right, but for the parents who are walking their students uh, to school every day, right? When there's gunshots ringing out at, at, at North Star last year, during the pandemic, right, we had one of our outreach workers. Can I name drop him real quick? Simi, uh, Samuel Gordon, right? Right, he like he moved students back into the building uh, when there was gunshots. So you again, you don't need a title to do the work. Um, you just got to be willing to listen, 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 um, and relearn like what safety really means. Yes, and to be clear, right, I would bet you know, a million paychecks over and over and over again for the next 10 years that every single outreach worker, and I'm putting that in quotes because you said that's a title, right? Yep. That every single outreach worker does outreach work, not just during school dismissal safe passage. Them brothers are doing it on the their own porches, outside yep. shop, right? When they're going to go buy food, like they're doing it all day long and not just under the, the title of outreach worker. Now, shout out to Simi, 100%, most definitely, right? We're going to get into a little later, though, because what I don't want is audience members, especially if you're not a part of the choir, and you're like, okay, I tuned in to be convinced about getting involved. And now this brother is talking about <laughs> leading kids in during gunshots. I don't know about all that. I don't know about all that. What about this sidewalk talk? Nah, I'm good. 
Yeah, Hold yeah. on. Just wait. <laughs> Just wait. We're going to get to you and we're going to say and ask the questions that are on people's mind that they don't necessarily have a platform to ask them. So hold on to that uh, resist that. Um, I wouldn't say resistance, but that that question. Right. So, Solomon, let's move on. Right. We've defined safety, community based public safety. I think that's laying a great foundation for the rest of the conversation because we have to be all um, you know, dealing with the same definitions, right? Especially if we're all trying to go for the same outcome, we the outcomes need to be defined as a collective, right? Um, so this this episode here, I mean, the, the last episode, like I said, community-based public safety is the theme for this month. We tried to do more macro-level conversation in the last episode. Um, however, if any of the choir knows Solomon, you know he loves some macro-level <laughs> macro action. And so we're going to touch on it briefly. If there's a funnel, right, and the macro-level policy, legislation, government, all that stuff is up here. Then we go to kind of providers and elected officials and things like that, and we're going to get to that. And then at the bottom of the funnel is you and me, he and she, they and them, and we're all here. What do we do at the bottom? So that's kind of how the rest of our conversation is going to go. The top of it, though, right? Like, we can't ignore that. So from your perspective, super familiar with this perspective, the macro-level landscape of this work, how does it need to change? Not even defining necessarily what it is, but how does it need to change and why? Yeah. Can I can I give my city that I love so much hope, right? Mm-hmm. NC, uh, listen, look, NCST, I want to go back to NCST really quick because it's an example. Mm-hmm. Like NCST, uh, founded by Mayor Raz J. Baraka, right? Uh, he had this vision, like, if, if we, you know, train up people from the community to solve conflicts that, you know, we can stop violence within our neighborhood. His theory has proven right. Right, his theory has proven right. For the past seven years, we've seen crime reduction here in the city of Newark. And we're not we're not only talking about data, right, and, and numbers that you see when they do the police reports and report outs. We're seeing more people outside, right? We're seeing more people engage, right? We're seeing, as they call it, uh, gentrification happening because when gentrification happens, it's often because neighborhoods are becoming, uh, cities are becoming, what, safer? And so we're, we're seeing this, this stuff happens uh, in, within our city. And we're also, we understand like on a federal level, um, Newark, the great city of Newark is laying the foundation for the rest of the country when it comes to this work, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Everyone across the country is coming to Newark to see the people like Simi, to see his work, right? Mm-hmm. To see the, the work like uh, Natasia and all those folks who are standing outside uh, doing safe passage because they recognize, right? For too long on a macro level, right? They've been investing millions and billions of dollars into a system that doesn't really touch the people, right? Mm-hmm. We have like privatized on a macro level has been privatizing safety, right? And so we need in the community, right? Is to really understand like safety is in our hands, right? And the government has realized like, you know, we, we don't have the, all the solutions, but there is a model. There's a, a model in Newark that has changed the landscape across this country. And so when people are in Newark and they're like, man, crime is going up. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I bear witness to this every day of lives being saved every day here in the city of Newark. That's not talked about, you know, on Richard Lee uh, uh, media, right? <laughs> you know, RLS, it's not talked about there, right? It's barely talked about on NJ.com. But on a macro level, like, listen, the government, the federal government is recognizing the work and they're willing to invest in it. We're talking about historical $5.2 billion that's gonna to come to communities like Newark to invest in this work that we're doing, uh, we're calling community-based public safety. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So then, um, what? It, well, I have just quick follow-up question. What is at stake if we drop the macro-level ball? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what's as, so in order to, you know, in, the reason why we're there is because a lot of work has happened on the ground, right? Mm-hmm. That allow this stuff to kind of move up to the federal level. All right. If we, if we drop the ball, right? So the money is going to come from the feds, right? From the feds is going to come to the state, right? These dollars that's supposed to be invested into community, right? It's going to go from the feds to the state 
to the county or the city in which you're living in, right? That's where the money stops at, right? It is our job as a community to advocate for those dollars. We no longer need money to sit in government, right? Because it has failed us. When when money sits in government, what happens? They buy more police vehicles. They put more cameras up, right? But none of that money is coming directly to 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 Jaheem, who really needs to relocate because they're trying to take his life, right? right? And the only thing Jaheem wants to do is really walk to work, work to the walk to the bus stop and go to work. And so we have to remain involved and and follow the dollars. You know, it's my promise, right, to to the residents of Newark that I will follow those dollars and making sure that those dollars are allocated uh, appropriately to to the communities that most need it. Right. And so for you, and I asked that question on purpose, right? Some, by the way, sidewalk talk, like, do I ask questions that I may know parts of the answer? Yes, but I'm trying to pull it out of my guest's mouth. You know what I mean? Because... I thank you for, I asked that question on purpose because first of all, the way you just broke down the, the, the flow of money, sometimes folks don't know that, including me. I have a lot to learn about macro levels, you know, policy and and stuff like that, because honestly, when you've been working on the sidewalk so long, right, I'll be honest, a lot of macro level, you know, work feels very overwhelming to me. And so it makes me just want to bury myself in the sidewalk stuff because look, all that, that's, that's too big and that's too much. And like, there's people that do that. The reason why I bring up the macro level though, and I just want to say this out loud in this episode is that is a lane. That is a lane. So if anyone is watching that again, doesn't already do this work, if you are watching and wondering and you don't want to be rushing kids in in the middle of gunshots and you don't want to be cleaning up blood on the sidewalk, you don't want to be at visuals, like if you don't want to have car <laughs> car counseling sessions with oxtail, you know what I'm saying? Like if you don't want to do all that like boots on the ground work, that macro level advocacy is a lane. Hop in it, learn it. Hop in it. And by the way, we keep using, the, you know, the name Jaheem, but like for, you know, for, cause again, and I already said this at the beginning, I work with individuals before, during and after incarceration. So I've had certain classes during incarceration behind the wall, convincing them they are, some of them with their PhD brilliance are super fit for macro level. Mm-hmm, what? Mm-hmm. They would turn Trenton upside down with all their knowledge and walking encyclopedia selves. Like, so that macro level, we also don't want to pinpoint, like, put credible messengers in sidewalk stuff. Sometimes they can train. They can they can definitely do the macro level policy work. And sometimes we try to just put them on sidewalk. But, like, I'm here to say that I had a, one particular group that's good for macro. So I'm saying that out loud. Right. That's a lean. Yeah, but here's the thing. We have to really be intentional about our investment, right? Yes. If we're yes. like, yo, go to Macy's, <laughs> but yes. my neighborhood is burning down yes. with violence, and I'm a and I'm and I got some real pull in my neighborhood, I should be paid. You know what I'm saying? I should be yes. paid to stop the violence because you're paying someone else. Yeah. Sixty thousand with benefits, with life insurance, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> To come in and tell us what safety they need to provide. Right, right. So again, this has to be intentional. This has to be intentional opportunities for sustainable, you know, wealth and for sustainable wealth and sustainable opportunities for for our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It's just like on a like on a macro level, it's it's so big, right? But when we when we work, we talk about like little rocks, right? What little rocks can do. The most littlest rock, right? If thrown off the uh, the tallest building, can really have some damage, some impact, right? And so we formulate, we gather all the little rocks, right? We gather all the storytelling, right? We gather all all all, all the experiences, and we say macro level. Here we come. We're coming with stories. We're coming with our own um, my own policy agenda, right? And guess what? Collectively, we can make it happen. Mm-hmm. We can make safety um, real within our neighborhoods, but we have to come together to make it happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you. Just on the macro level piece, like we had to touch on it. Like we can't come down to the sidewalk. I feel like it's an injustice to not speak on, um, you know, at, not take the window of opportunity to comment on macro level 
you know, work. Um, so now we're going to get a little bit into, <laughs> and I feel like I need to repeat this several times in case new people come and watch and think Miss Berry is like on some, like what is coming out of her mouth. But right now what I'm about to do family and we've never done this on sidewalk talk, but I feel, and I feel super passionate about this recently in recent days to play devil's advocate with my brother Solomon, right? So I, you know, we all, not just me, Solomon has heard some of these things I'm about to say as well, but we hear rhetoric from all kinds of players in this work, right? And so I found it like when, when we thought about this topic and we wanted to do this topic justice, it was about saying out loud the terrible, heartbreaking, um, sometimes just ignorance is bliss, right? I won't blame everybody who's saying what I'm about to say, right? Sometimes it's just how people are feeling. But to say these things out loud to give Solomon a chance to respond, okay? Because sometimes it's just paragraph debates <laughs> on social media. And so, like, I just want to have this right here. Like, well, what about this? And what about that? And I'm feeling like, right... So um, we've all heard this rhetoric, though. But no, this is not Miss Berry's position. Okay, so I just want to say that out loud. So we're gonna start with providers, mm -hmm. then police officers, then some government elected officials, generally speaking. Okay, we're gonna start there, and then we're gonna get into community. Like, well, they're the community too, but you get what I'm saying. So sure. let's start with service providers, right? So I'm gonna say a quote. And you give your response to this, this sentiment, I should say. Okay? So okay. I'm a service provider. I didn't really designate a lane, but I'm a service provider. You know what, Solomon? Like, I hear you. See, we're about to get my acting skills on. So, <laughs> so, we, so I hear you. All that is well and good. But, like, you do 24-7. I do, you know, 9 to 5, Solomon. I, don't, I, I hear you. But, like, there's no really money to do anything meaningful. And I heard what you just said, like, that it's your promise that you're going to get the money to us, Solomon. But, like, right now, it's no money there. And we're all fighting over the same dollars. Yes, I said what I said. Yes, I That's did, right. family. Yes, I did. End of quote. Where are you at with that, Solomon? <laughs> oh, man. that's uh, So that that's true, right, Leah? Um, so I would say when I was, I think, 15, I met Mildred Crump for the first time, right? Uh, she's now retired from the city council. And she told me, you need to find something really good and stick to it. And I was like, oh, okay. I hear you, politician, right? But what she said was right, right? And so for a service provider, right? When you're like, there's no money, we're all fighting over the same money. Well, what we like to say, and I will echo Mildred Crump is like, Find something that you do really, really well, right? When it comes to safety, safety is so big, folks. It's like so big that you can find something within safety uh, as a service provider, right? If your sole job as a, uh, as a service provider, social service agent, is to do referrals, right? Make sure that your referral game is at the best, at the top level, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you refer, we're not doing cold handoffs. We're not doing warm what's handoffs. That? What's that? What's a cold, oh, a cold, cause a cold handoff? Because like, what's that? Yeah, cold handoff is like, hey, um, uh, I, I don't want to go off topic, but you know, Nork is facing like a lot of evictions coming January first, and say, hey, here's a list of places that can help you pay your rent. That's a cold handoff, right? Um, a warm handoff, maybe. Let me try to call this place for you, right, uh, and see if they answer. We don't need e e any one of those. We need guarantees. I'm like, when I'm at work every day, I'm like, if it's not guaranteed, do not send a Newark resident there mm -hmm. at all. Because I want to make sure when someone comes to us that we're clear what we do, what we provide as an agency, right? So you as a social service agent, I'm like, hey, be clear with what you provide, right? And provide that to the best that you can. Meanwhile, you continue to advocate for what you believe your, your clients need. Because what's happening is that a lot of people are, coming to work, they're providing a service, and they're punching out, right? But there's no advocacy behind it. Like, look, we really need funding for this, right? Or we really need funding for that. Um, because we are too afraid to say that because our jobs may be at jeopardy. Hmm. I mean, let me say that again. Like, we're too afraid to say 
what we really need because our jobs are at jeopardy. I mean, when you're in a position like that, you do a disservice to the people that you're trying to service. And so I would say, look, advocate for um, what you need, uh, but do what you do really well and be excellent at it because your excellent will have a ripple effect for your client. You're like, we're really clear, like at, at NCST, like, uh, and and a, and, a, and a social workers get mad at me. And I don't really care. I'm like, look, y'all, we don't provide housing. That's not what we do, right? But we have a great resource that provides housing, and so we're going to lean on them, right? And so I would I would recommend that to like social service providers is that we do what you do really well. You do it with excellence, so that when that client that resident leaves, they know that you have your be the best intention for them. Mm -hmm. And so what I hear you saying is like being, a, and I've, I've been in agency, I'm definitely not shout out no names, but like I've been in agencies that we functioned as a one-stop shop or like we thought we were a one-stop shop and mm -hmm. like, you know, master, what do they say? Master of all trades, but Jack of none, Jack, the other way around, yeah. right? Right. So like, you know, it's okay to not be a one-stop shop. It's okay to just do your lane and do it really well. But I love the point just about referring to a guaranteed opportunity and Eddie Wilson said results not numbers. Right? Results not numbers, yeah. And yet that that dollar piece be getting people like we you know, folks forget <laughs> results not numbers. So I appreciate Eddie Wilson bringing that up. Um and so Okay, can I just say can I say real quick? Yes. Like Eddie Wilson is an interesting guy. I'm glad that he's on because if it wasn't for Eddie Wilson, I wouldn't be here today. That's a true story. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that he is on, right? He encouraged me like he knows my heart is for Newark, right? But he encouraged me to take on this um, this this role at my, my job. But he also continues to encourage me to, you know, keep the results first, not numbers. And so, like, Eddie Wilson is the reason. I'm telling you right now, he's the reason why I'm here. Shout Salute out to Eddie Wilson. Salute to yeah, Eddie Wilson. Like, whoever he is. Whoever he is. <laughs> that investment, that investment brought mighty harvest, Eddie Wilson. <laughs> mighty harvest. <laughs> So on the topic of funding, right, and money, right, because sidewalk talk is real talk. Like, we're going to have real talk and we're going to say certain things that I said at the beginning. We're going to unpack truths that aren't often being discussed, right? Having nuanced conversations that aren't being had, right? So then when it comes to the macro level government where you said earlier, you said the money sits in government. Like, if money sits in government, then X, Y, and Z, right? Generally speaking... I feel like I should have a little ticker <laughs> across the disclaimer, right? We're not talking about anybody in specific. <laughs> We're talking about in general, right? Um, government and elected officials and like funding streams, right? Macro level government funding streams. Um, quote, right? Quote in general. Okay, Solomon. Yeah, I hear. Oh, yeah, you do great work in this organization. Yeah, you guys are, you know, in front of the schools and rushing kids in from bullets. That is great. Great job. <laughs> great job, right? Um, but what do you need funding for? Money? For what? What do you really do that really needs to be funded? And you want how much? End yeah. of quote. End of quote. I got to put quotes around this. Solomon. Oh, no, no worries. No worries. Yeah, what, uh, what do you say to that? Because we, uh, we hear that, right? We hear that. Um, here's, here's an answer. Uh, and you do hear to... that. You, wait, yeah, yeah, you clarify. Do. You do hear that? Absolutely. Because that blew me away in our pre-meeting. I'll be super honest. Absolutely. That's crazy to me. Go ahead. Let, let, me, let me ask you a question, Aaliyah. Do you, do you think the police officers, right, who are paid to be uh, uh, protectors, right? I don't know. Because people have visions of what police officers are supposed to do. I know, like... Through education, what they're really supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. But if you if you pay police officers, right? Because uh, the the call is always for like more police officers to do to protect. Uh, if you pay them, right, and all that they're doing, and this is I'm not blanketing law enforcement, right. but the primary role, right, is to 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 arrest folks who are breaking the law. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna pay them, right, why not pay someone who's gonna save somebody's life, right? get them the the resources that they need so that they can be productive citizens why not pay them right how much how much should they be paid they should be paid a livable wage right like it, the city of newark right we're upside down with the way we um like financially like the wage gap here in new jersey is is terrible mm -hmm. um between like this, this the disparities between like black and white families right 
But here in Newark, we have an opportunity to control that. We have an opportunity in Newark to shift that, right? We're saying, look, those folks who are out there doing safe passes, right? They should be paid 40 plus, right? Right, they should be paid 40 plus for the work that they, I'm talking about 40,000, right? That will allow them to pay their rent because you guys know rent market, the price of rent is ridiculous here in the city of North. Yeah. It will allow them to pay their rent and have a couple of dollars, right? If they wanted to take their families out, after you rent. know, month to month. <laughs> right, after, <laughs> right, right. It's, so yeah, we, we need to pay the people who are doing this work because we're already paying people to do the work, right? They're not getting the results, as Eddie said, right? That those folks who are doing community-based public safety is doing, right? And listen, I, I respect law enforcement, you know, great comment. that's going right? to be the next quote. That's going to be great the next quote, quote Solomon. Great, great partners, right? Okay. But at the end of the day, like what we need from our law enforcement, um, you know, we need we need them to respect our communities, right? Understand what our communities are going through and, 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 and to be advocates with us to fight for these dollars because the work that folks are doing right now, who are getting paid little to no money without a title, without an organization, like they should be okay. like rewarded. For, we incentivize everything, right? We incentivize violence. How do we do that, right? With the with the prison industrial system, mm -hmm. right? We incentivize that stuff, right? Why not incentivize peace? Why not? Mm. Incentivize peace. Period. Yes. <laughs> Just dot period. <laughs> Incentivize peace. Incentivize peace. And to your point, like in, in the responding to that quote of generally speaking, a government, right? It's like you pay for everything else though. Right? And we mm -hmm. won't even get into, and I think I asked you this in the pre-meeting, like if, well, I won't even go there, but like, is that is our stereotypes and racism and prejudice built in and woven into that paradigm? We're going we gonna to leave that right there. That, that's no, 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 don't leave, it, don't leave it there. Right. Let me let me say real quick is that it is right. And again, here, I only can speak for the city of Newark that I love so much. Right. Is that we have an opportunity to to stop that stuff. Right. We have an opportunity to 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 end um, the the fact that folks don't have access to the resources that are granted to them. We have a chance to do it, but what we really need, right, is courageous leaders to go against the grain, right? I'm not only talking like elected. I'm not only talking about law enforcement, mm -hmm. right? I'm not only talking about those who get paid to do community-based public safety. We need courageous grandmothers. We need courageous moms, Leaders. right? We need yes. courageous communities to say, yes. look, yes. this is what we really need in our communities. Yes. And I think, and that's just, I want to say that like a million times over in this episode. When Solomon said leaders, did folks here, elected officials, providers, you know, um, credible message, like, did he, you hear not you? Right? Like, no, the, like everybody, the grandma, and what you said, the grandmother, the mother, the, like the crossing guard is a leader. You know what I'm saying? Like who, that, which we need <laughs> desperately, right? Like every single village member, you know, fits together in, you know, in a body and we need the pinky, we need the thumb, we need the foot, we need the elbow. Like we need everyone not, and not just yeah. the head and not everybody can be the head. Okay. All right. So Solomon, now you mentioned police officers, right? Because now we talk about the money and all this money going to public safety professionals. Okay. Well, quote, quote, and I quote, okay, I got to be clear about this. Ms. Berry is quoting and acting, right? So quote from some police officers, what the perspective may be. You public safety professionals are trying to take our place. You can't do what we do. You want us to leave? Okay, see how that goes. End of quote. What do you say to that, Sam? And you've kind of already touched on a little bit, but like make it real direct and explicit. Like we like we're not again, I'm not I'm not calling to end policing. Like that's not what we're trying to do, right? We have to work collectively together, right? at all times, right? With law enforcement, right? We, we got to work together. We look across New Jersey, right? I, I like to say like Chatham. Chatham has 13 police officers. What? 
13 police officers. And you can look on their website, right? Uh, and you can see every police officer's name uh, who's in the department, right? Wait, now, for the whole, wait, clarity, clarity. 13 police officers for the whole town of Chatham? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole town. The whole town. Mm, right? Okay. 13 police okay. officers for the whole town, right? Okay. You can, we can see the, their names on the list, right? Uh, but they that community has to find what safety means to them. To right? them, which we said. So, are- yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, to them. So similarly, right, we need to make sure, like, look, law enforcement, we understand your role. And we want this to be the center of our safety. And if someone steps out of like our safety bubble, then we need you to correct. As a community, we're saying, because we've seen this all the time. Like we see like specific neighborhoods in the city of Newark who've called for like law enforcement to get things changed. And because they have the political and economic status, things happen, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go to other neighborhoods within this same city, right? You, people make calls for action. Like, hey, we need, I need to be able to relocate, but that same that same energy isn't put into it. And so we need a complementary strategy with law enforcement, right? That protects the values and beliefs of uh, of of these neighborhoods. And so, no public safety professionals are not taking your jobs, right? Right. What we are only doing is making your job a lot easier. This is factual. We see it here in the city of Newark. Can I can I get an example? Mm-hmm. Uh, our guy, I would say our guy, Captain Peppers, who's about to retire. Yeah. Yeah. Love him dearly, man. He's been like, he's been one of the, I would say, really good officers in the city of Newark who has went above and beyond, right? There was a situation um, in the South War where a family, um, their son was, was holding a gun, right? Uh, and he was threatening to shoot someone. Captain Peppers gave me a call. So check this out. Check how this works. Captain Peppers gave me a call. I look at the call. I listen to the call. I'm like, okay, what do we do here? We call on our superhero, our public safety professional, Andre Hunter, right? Andre then goes and meets with the family, right? And try to figure out what's going on. We're looking at a year later, right? The mom is still sending text messages saying, listen, you saved my son's life, right? Like, thank you so much. And so this is how law enforcement community can work together. We're not trying to save a job. I mean, we're not trying to take your job. We're trying to save lives intentionally, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we we cannot arrest. You're right. We cannot arrest people, right, what law enforcement does, right? But what our executive director at North Community Street Team says is that we like to arrest situations. And when we arrest a situation, we then take that situation we figure out what's going on within that situation so it won't have to repeat itself. And so, yeah, law enforcement, we respect your work. We respect everything that you put your lives on the line every day uh, for for the, the sake of the sake of the safety of the city. But respectively, we have public safety professionals who are doing the same, who are not making as much money as you. Right. Who are also risking their lives to provide safety in their own community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and just to be clear, so like, you know, defund the police, right, was brought up in kind of the last episode. And that was, in my opinion, my personal opinion was like the worst hashtag like somebody could have made up because that's not what that meant. Like what it meant was to reallocate funds to community based you know, Mm. resources um, and organizations. And so I just want to be clear that like, and say out loud for me personally, um, there are things that I, I, Miss Berry can do that police officers cannot do. Right. And so when you talk about that complementary strategy, when you talk about you being your lane and do what you do and me being my lane and do what I do, there are things that I can do that you just can't. And there's things that I can do, Solomon, that you can't. And there's things that you can do that I can't. Facts. And so, like, when I even teach leadership behind the wall, I tell them that. Like, there's certain things that you can say and because of your wisdom and your own journey of transformation that you can say out your mouth because and no young person going to be like, get out of my face, you don't know what you're talking about. Right? Yeah. But there's certain things that Miss Berry can do, too, that, like, you know, people can't do. So there's certain walls that come shattering down when I hit a block, yeah. right? There's yeah. certain conflicts that I can de-escalate, right? Off, off relationship and rapport building in about 10 seconds, which I'm really good at, 
right? Mm-hmm. But then there's other things that Solomon can do, that other people on this Damon can do, right? My pastor Tawana Thompson. <laughs> That she, let's not sleep on Pastor Tawana Thompson. That she could do on that block, right? That, like, just police can't do. So I think it is about embracing whatever that complementary strategy kind of looks like. Yeah, and I I just want to say, like, you know, law enforcement, they are a system-led group, right? Meaning they, they work within a system, the government system. And so they have to get, seek permission to do stuff outside of their norm. Mm, mm, mm. You know what I'm saying? They have to yes. seek permission. Yes. But guess what, Grandma? You ain't got to seek permission to bake right. me that sweet potato pie and bring it to my house and have a conversation with me. You ain't got to seek permission. <laughs> you just got to do it. Yeah, yeah you just got to do it. Yes. And you got to create that dialogue. You can create that dialogue without, you know, seeking permission. Yes, that's a great that's, point. You know, that's a difference. Yes, that's a great point. That's a great point. So... We've talked about grandma, right? And now we're going to smooth slide in to community members, right? So like, yes, we we talked about providers and how providers may be feeling. We talked about macro level. We talked about police officers. We talked about government and all of their perspectives. And still what we say about community-based public safety to those stakeholders, right? I should say in the village. But now Mm -hmm. the most important part, this is like the grand finale of the episode, and I'm feeling super passionate about this part in these recent days because, to be very honest, right, we could watch this episode in a year and, you know, it may not be the case in a year. But in recent time, and I have also found during holiday season specifically, we actually did a Sidewalk Talk episode about a year ago about the manifestation of pain during holiday season. Mm -hmm. And how holiday season is particularly violent because of the manifestation of pain. We're not going to have a whole another episode about that. But part two, part two, part two. Word, word, because I could do that every holiday. But that is kind of at play right now. And for those of us boots on the ground, we prepare for this season every year. We know this season is coming. So, yes, it has been particularly violent in the community, right? And I quote Solomon. (laughs) And I quote. So I'm going to just rattle off some perspectives of some people. I'm not making this up, family, and this is not my perspective, okay? I want to be clear. Um, But these are some perspectives that are floating around. Crime is the mayor's problem. Me and mine are good. These kids don't listen. They are wailing. They are not, you know, doing what they need to do. We and we in my house and mine are good. They are the problem. How am I supposed to actually make a difference? I don't associate with criminals. Wouldn't I be in danger if I tried to intervene? I would prefer to mind my business. End of quote. Convince the folks that are on that perspective, Solomon. Please convince them. Yeah, I mean, you keep minding your business and your community is going to look the way it looks, right? You keep minding your business. And that's real. Like, do you know your neighbor? Can you tell me your neighbor's name? If you live in a building, do you know your next door name, next door neighbor name, right? Like this, this all is part of like, as we define as like structural violence, right? And like the concept, like we are so afraid to have a conversation with each other, Leah, right? Like when we when we see uh, Auntie on the corner, right? When we when we see her, we drop by her, right? When we see her, we laugh at her, right? Mm-hmm. When we see when we see the young men on the corner, we're like, call the police. They gotta get off the off the corner, right? But we're really not trying to engage, right? What we're doing is structural violence, and to a point, it is racist. Yes, you can be racist against your own people. And we've been doing this for years in the city of Newark. It's like, you know, the haves and the have nots. What I'm saying, Aaliyah, to those who talk like that, who think that way, I said, I can almost guarantee you, you don't know the people on your block. Because if you know the people on your block, then most likely, you know, you will have a safe block because they're going to know your values and your beliefs. But if your values and beliefs is like, yo, we're going to shoot up the block, then that's what your block is going to be. If your values and belief is like we're going to have clean streets on our block, then that's what your that's what your safety looks like. That's what your block is going to be. And so I, you know, I, I like to say this: like my transformational moment happened when I was working in Yorktown, Virginia. Right, 
I had befriended a, a resident in Yorktown, low income Section Eight property, right? Be, be, befriended this guy, played ball with him. My last night in Virginia before I moved to Rhode Island, right, to work at a group home, right, with my wife. This guy told me that he was a functional drug addict, hmm. right? And for me, for the past 25 years, I've been trying to avoid this stuff, right? Because I know my mom, I know my dad, right? I know the path that they took and what the outcomes were for my family, right? But if I didn't befriend Rico, right? And I befriended him because I didn't think anything was wrong with him. He seemed normal to me, right? But when he trusted, like, hey, this is what I struggle with, it, it, it changed my life. Why? Because in my own city of Newark, there are thousands of Ricos, right? There are thousands of people like him who just want services, who want to be heard, who want to be, you know, befriended um, so that they can start feeling safe. And so, like, I would encourage folks to really get to know your neighbors um, and, and, and demand, like, your block, like, you, you pay rent there, sis. Like, you, you pay rent there, bro. Like, you really going home and just going in the house because you're afraid to go to your, go outside? Unheard of. And we got to, you know, in our city, Newark, we have to stop that um, and stop avoiding conversations and really sincerely want people to do well. And I mean, sincerely want people to do well. Can I, I'm going to take it a step further, right? This yeah, last ahead. piece, we was going to go back and forth on devil's advocate. I ain't going to leave it at one sentence, right? So yeah, get ready, Solomon. He's like, oh, this, Aaliyah's working, working this. Yes, yes, because that could be an answer. And I still hear certain community members taking it a step further. So I'm going to take it a step further on their behalf because we we got to say these things out loud and we need the, the answers to be said out loud. Otherwise, like people walk away even from this episode with, yeah, but, and then no change and impact occurs. So I'm going to take it a step further, right? Okay. Yes, I know my neighbors. Yes, I know their names. Um, but... There, you know, and yes, I even know the individuals on the block who perpetuate harm mm. because I watched him in kindergarten move in to the neighborhood and I even saw him go left, Solomon. My bad. I was trying to mind my business. My bad. Mm -hmm. But now he's in ninth grade, 10th grade, you know, 20, however old, right? Now what, Solomon? You want me to what? Talk to him? Roll up on him? Like, what do you want me to do exactly? It's two things you can do, right? Right. Quote, if you, if quote. You... Me... Sorry, I yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. In, in the quote, it's fine. Talking about Miss uh, Berry don't want to... <laughs> no, no, no. Miss no, Berry don't want to go sit on the sidewalk. I said that at the beginning. Go ahead. <laughs> but it, here's the thing. I realize, like, everybody's now not, you know, about it, right? As we like to say, they're not about it, right? And so... Um, th th there's two things you do. You can do if you feel like you have a relationship with this person, whoever they are. You know everybody, right? You know everybody's business. You're the district leader. I don't know what you are. You're somebody, <laughs> right? Um, then I would say be courageous, hmm. right? And ask that question. Listen, I haven't been home. I just got home, you know, three years ago. I've been gone for eight years, right? Back and forth, right? There was an issue on Evergreen. I went there and I said to the young man. Bro, what do we have to do? Listen, no title, no nothing. He doesn't know who I work for. I said, bro, I said, what do we have to do to make this the safest block in the in the South Ward? You know what he said to me, Aaliyah? What did he say? He said, now listen, this is a guy who was shooting up the block. He says, listen, the truth is I just need to get out of here. Can you help me get out of here? And it broke my heart. Why? Because I didn't have the resources to get this guy out. I say to him, look, yo, give me give me some time to kind of work on it, right? We went three months. You can look at the crime stats. You can look at the crime stats. Three months without a shooting on that block. Mm. This guy gets arrested. Guess what happens? Shots. Why were we not paying this guy to keep mm. his neighborhood safe? Listen, he did it for three months. What, what, what I'm saying, one way. Because, again, just to reemphasize, because you asked him as a regular resident just what can him. we do to, and you didn't know, use no fancy language. Nope. You didn't use, you just said, repeat what you asked the man. Ask him, what can we do to make this the safest neighborhood in the South Ward? That's all you asked. As a regular person, and then there was no shootings for the next three for months. months. For the next three months. Here, here, <laughs> so 
you can be bold and courageous and ask those questions and ask that question, right? I like that approach a lot, right? Um, because you get to see like you know what people really need, and you'll get to say, okay, can we work on this collectively, right? But in the meantime, can we can we only shoot once a week instead of instead of five times a week? Can we, can we do it? About to can hit try on it? harm reduction. Can we, can we try have it? a whole well, different well, harm reduction. You know, it, by the way, I learned this. I only learned this because of um, our executive director, Damon Durden. He talked about yeah. the he talked about the walk down, right? Like, how can you walk somebody down from shooting five times to one time yes, to zero times, yes, right? Yes, yes. Right. I just I said, give me some time to work on it, right? But at the, I knew when I left this young man, I didn't have what he needed, and so frankly, making calls so that he can. So that he can uh, move, but he wanted to get violated from uh, parole, and it's just been crazy. But you know, that's that's one approach. The other approach is like, look, you can call organizations like the Newark Community Street Team, where we have paid, right, public safety professionals who will intervene in conflicts, right, um, who, who are really professionals at this, who will not arrest people, but arrest the situation. Look, let me say this real quick, Newark, listen. It works. It works so well. Today, I got a call from someone all the way in Bergen County, actually, yeah, Bergen County, top of Bergen County, and said, hey, can you drive an hour and a half out here to mediate a situation? I said, uh, no, I can't. But because we work with excellence and urgency, I said, look, we can set up a zone tomorrow. We can figure something out. I'm telling you that it works so much. Like People are calling from across the state to figure out how to do it, right? To call organizations like the North Community Street Team who do work in the city of Newark. So, and I'm going to add, keep going, right? So if, again, quote, because I've already called the North Community Street Team <laughs> many times and way far back, way before me and you even knew each other, Solomon, years mm-hmm. and years and years ago, I had to call the North Community Street Team to fix a conflict from inside, right? And yeah. because, again, y'all have a lane. Ms. Bevy's not in that lane. However, I know the conflict, and therefore I'm going to call who could hop in that lane, right? So I am a supporter, and I will call. I'll vouch for that myself. But for other people that say, so if I call y'all and you come to mediate a conflict, are they going to find out that I called you and feel some type of way? That's an honest yeah, so- question. That's an honest question. Yeah, let me let me share this with you. Uh, we we got called to do a mediation by law enforcement. They called us again and said, "Hey, can you go mediate the situation?" We go out there uh, and, and try to mediate the situation. Um, uh, and after the, the the mediation, the young lady called the mayor and was like, "I don't know why you sent this dude out here because the mediation ain't working." And and I I wound up going back to the young lady and I said, "Listen, the mediation is only going to work if you make it work." Right. If you hold your end of the bargain up, right? If you say, look, I'm not going to do X to offend this person, right? This is the only way that this stuff really works if we have an agreement, right? That says that we're going to maintain peace within our neighborhoods. And so, yeah, if you call, we're hoping that you're calling because you know the person and you want to really sincerely, intentionally mediate whatever conflict that you're having. So, yes, it works when you are intentional about your outcome. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that my that quote said, right, was um, definitely a us versus them that I don't associate with criminals, right? Mm-hmm. The us versus them, that thing for someone that serves them, <laughs> right, with my whole life, that thing breaks my heart all the time. I think to not vilify, right, the them, which we're going to get into in regards to like when the them is a member of your family or is your boyfriend or girlfriend, et cetera. But the last piece I want to say about this community member piece um, is about these kids, quote unquote, these kids, these kids, this new generation, these kids don't have a, co- this is off script. I could just say this because I've heard it so much. These kids don't have a code. These kids are wailing. These kids don't listen. These kids are different. Mm-hmm. End of quote. How do I build relationship with these kids? I'm not, when I'm not asking to build a relationship, we're not asking to build a relationship. We're asking you to cultivate, mm. right? In order to cultivate, you have to plant the seed, right? Right. So you have to say something to them. Like Someone a good morning. Oh, <laughs> a good morning, morning is a seed, family. <laughs> yeah, seed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can't just say right. good morning. That's it. 
That, that's it. We're actually to cultivate, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, we're actually to plant the seed. So if you see someone, I, you know, I have a saying, like, I speak life, right? Everything that's going to come out of my mouth is going to be something positive, right, to you. Because I want to cultivate, I want to plant that seed, right? I want to lay the soil, the, the the best soil possible, so that when we root up, right, that something beautiful comes out of it. And so we have to speak to these young people. And we can't speak to them. Like, I think we fall into a trap, and I'm going to be honest with you. Like, we fall into a trap thinking that we need to know the lingo and the lingo and whatever, whatever. I like to say, listen. Uh, and I get in trouble by my friends and, and family members for doing this, but I can go to any neighborhood in the country, right? And feel safe. Why? Because my intention yes. is only to serve. We see this here. Hear me out. We see this, right? There's a there's a group of like missionaries that come around our city all the time. The Mormons on the bikes, right? They come around our cities. They come here unharmed because the intention mm. is to spread their gospel. Can you spread your gospel, grandma, auntie, uncle? Mm -hmm. Can you spread it? Can you plant that seed? That's what we're asking you to do. Say a good morning. Say something positive. Speak life into death. That's what we're asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and even and it reminds me of a past episode where it was like um, I think this was with Marsha Armstrong, one of our earlier earlier episodes. Because like when especially working with young people, as she does, like the what's in your eyes does kind of matter when you talk about intention, right? Like, it's true. We could go to any neighborhood anywhere, right? Of all classes, colors, wherever, but you can feel and see my intention. Um, and so, family, right, if your intention is still not right, though, right, and you do still have a vilifying in your heart, right, then you do some work on that before you even force a good morning, <laughs> because, right, and maybe even thinking until you make it, maybe continuing to say good morning can fix what's, whatever's going mm -hmm. on inside because that thing will come out through your eyes. But to your point, Solomon, no, you do not have to talk the language, although we can, right? I'm mm -hmm. definitely bi dialectical, um, but that is not necessary to say good morning and speak life into our young people. That's it. And Ali brought this up in the episode, how he would, in Safe Passage, NCST, way back in the day, he would say, mm -hmm. oh, good morning, bruh. And they would be like, keep going. They wouldn't even acknowledge him. Then the next morning, good morning, bruh. And they would look. The next morning, they would nod. And the next morning, they'd be like, yo, bruh, what's your name? Like, you out here five days in a row saying good morning to me. Mm -hmm. So sometimes to remain consistent in the, in the planting and the cultivating. That's deep, yeah. Solomon. Mm -hmm. um, so then kind of the last piece is the family members, though, right? Like who we know, we know who is perpetuating harm. We know very personally, right? They're in our kitchen, in our living room, in our bedroom, in our families, mm -hmm. we, we, in our classrooms, right? So last thing I'll just say about young people, that peer-to-peer -peer leadership, though, right? Peers can do so much more than me and Solomon combined. So when you turn out leaders in young people, they could they could uh, put the fire out in the city. But who's putting leadership in them, or are we dismissing them as incapable leaders? I'm just saying there'll be a whole firefighter squad out here and put all the fires out if we invest in our young people as leaders. But let me let me say this about like the type of young folks we need to invest in, right? Okay. And I'm not, I'm not and I'm not shaming anybody who makes A B on a row, right? And who have resources at home, right? Right. Right. No, your not, target though. <laughs> who are not involved in in this activity that we're trying to stop, right? So this is like something that happens across the city, right? I've seen this actually. I see this across the country where we're like, oh, we want to listen to the youth, and so then we we grab those youth who are going to sit in a room and have a, a, a sophisticated conversation with us, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not the target that we're really looking for, right? Mm -hmm. We're looking at, like, these young men who are uh, perpetrating violence, mm -hmm. right? And we're saying to them, right, like, bro, sis, like, again, how can we make this safe? Like, how can we support you? And genuinely mean that. And then we have the resources to back it up. Like bro, can I, can I pay you every day to go to school? Right? Can I pay you every day to go to school and not commit violence? Can I do that? Because what's happening is that, and I think we had this conversation before, like people like, especially like people who've graduated high school, right? Or didn't graduate, like they're not beefing so much over the female herself, right? 
They're, they're not beefing over her herself, mm-hmm. right? They're beefing, like they're having arguments over her stability. Like we're we're shooting people over stability because she might have that Section Eight voucher, or she may have that the, su- the sustainable housing, and we need someone to lay our head, right? But can we can we can we pay you, young man or, or young sis, to go to school? Can we pay you to not commit violence? Mm-hmm. And seek to understand. How many people, how many young people will deny that? Right. Because now I don't have to go in a corner and sell, right? I don't have to go steal cars, right? Because what I'm really doing, I'm stealing the cars, I'm shipping them to the, uh, I'm sending them to the shipyard and I'm dropping them hot off right here um, on Fabian, right? And then the tow truck is coming, grabbing that car and it's taking it to the shipyard. Then they're going to send that car overseas to China or South, South, South Africa. So listen, they're like, why not incentivize peace? Why not give our kids dollars to keep peace? Mm, mm. And we're going because we're, 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 we're too afraid. We're too afraid. So Solomon, then as a family member, right? My, you know, my son is in the streets. I did the best I could. I don't know what else to do. My boyfriend, it, this is all quotes, y'all, quotes, okay? <laughs> For my people, right? I did the best I could. My son is in the streets. I don't know what else to do, right? Um, my, you know, quote, my boyfriend, yeah, I know what he get into, Solomon, but that's my man. Like, what What you want? You want me to, like, make him, like, he not, and he not going to listen to me, right? My son, my daughter now, you know, it's definitely girls out here, let's be clear. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they they're not going to listen to me. And it might not be young people. My 42 year old uncle won't listen to me. So what do you say to the family members? And all of us know who is what? I mean, we in a community, we're in a community. So we're all very interconnected. Very interconnected. Um, there's a lot of people you'd be surprised, like how interconnected it is, right? We all know each other. So, like, what do you say to to you know people that do know people who perpetuate violence? What is yeah, what can what can they do? Yeah, I want to say be consistent, right? I think you, you said this earlier, like being consistent with your message, right? I you know I share a story all the time. It's like you know, I was in foster care, right? My foster mom was fine with my brother selling drugs, right? As long as he gave her something money right but the moment that he stopped selling like the moment that he stopped giving her money then it becomes the issue right uh then she calls calls the cops on him or then you know i've had enough you got to leave out the house because you know be consistent right be intentional and say look you know son nephew daughter niece like we want you to be well and so what we're not going to do is allow you to self-destruct what we're going to do is wrap our arms around you. But what happens is we like to play the line, right? Mm. You know, as long as he ain't doing it, as long as he ain't doing that. You mm. know, we, we do that, right? Instead of saying, no, we're, we we need you to be well because we need you alive. We need you to, you know, to be here with us because we value you. We don't value our loved ones enough to say this because we're too afraid, right? We're too afraid that they may harm us, mm-hmm. right? But what, what, what I'm what I'm encouraging folks to do is have those conversations because ultimately what's going to happen, I've seen it in my own family, right? My oldest brother was gunned down because he was a, a drug dealer, right? right? But, you know, my mom wasn't courageous enough because she didn't have the support to have this conversation with my, old brother, my older brother, right? Mm-hmm. We got to, you know, be courageous, have the support. If you feel like you have the support, have that conversation with them and say, look, this is this is the path that we want to take for you. This is a path that you know we see in you. We see greatness. You have to use words of affirmation, positivity, in order for someone to speak. But if we're saying, if we're if we're saying, look, uh, you know, no n word, you know, you can't do this. No, you just like this, just like, like we're gonna we're we're incentivizing this violence, right? When we do stuff like that, but we have to be intentional and say, listen, like this is what we see for your future, right? And this is what we don't want to happen. We can't take the money that they're giving us. We know the money dirty in a sense, right? Right. We we, we can't take the car that they're giving us because we know it's stolen, right? We got to be firm and what again what people do, and they won't be honest with themselves, right? Is that they 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 play that line, and it doesn't you know lead to great outcomes at all. And I would say, look, if you are like firm in your beliefs and you're being honest and you're communicating with them, that's not enough. Again, I'm not trying to put the burden on NCST, but call NCST. I've seen it 
firsthand, right? I've seen guns be removed from houses, right? I've seen, you know, folks going to rehab. I've seen people relocate, right? And it's not only in CST, I want to be clear, it's the infrastructure, right? The support system, right? Aaliyah, you're on the public safety roundtable. Safety doesn't happen unless we have an ecosystem of great providers that are able to service our clientele. So if you feel like, look, you had this conversation with your loved ones, call a service provider, call organizations like NCST to, to, to help out. And um, again, I'm not dismissing any other organization in the city. I just know the work that NCST does. And so I don't want to put the, a false burden on any other organization that doesn't do the work. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, and, and just the, the last piece before we get into our call, like specific call to action, because we've already oh, yes, given exactly. about a million calls to action, right? There have been like so many different calls to action, um, but Solomon's going to leave us with three in particular. The last piece that I would say about this, and, and you kind of said this, and it does require courage. Um, but I have found to, you know, once you already are coming at a person who who does perpetuate violence, right? When you're already coming with love, which if that's your uncle, your cousin, your boyfriend, like you're coming with love, like there's love in your eyes, like you already, you know what I'm saying? Like you're already um, personal and intimate in that way. At a certain point, we need to tell them how their actions do make us feel. Come on now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that, that is an approach that like, we're trying to systematize as well, but like, we need to tell them like, I, cause I'm not all people think just because I work in the street or work with individuals before they're going to have incarceration that yeah. like, I just, I want to hug them to death and let the, you know, trauma, yeah. Trauma counseling. No, that is a part of the, the, the discussion, but accountability is a part of the discussion as well. And I'm all for that as well. And so some of those threads in social media is like, I'm not excusing anyone, right? We still need to hold folks accountable. And I'll leave this with this kind of piece of the a story. At the NCST roundtable, which I will um, say in the end as a call to action, if anyone wants to join, um, there was one day where we were talking about brains on the sidewalk, Solomon. Mm. Mm -hmm. At the NCST roundtable. And the topic was how to clean up brains on the sidewalk. Right? You remember this meeting? This was early on in my participation in the round. No, no, I'm with you. I said, we are talking about what? I clutched my purse like this, right? Okay. And and like how to clean up a crime scene and you call like 800 number and like all that kind of stuff, right? I was so disturbed by the fact that we were even having a conversation about brains on the sidewalk. I brought that exact conversation behind the wall into a correctional facility. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe or maybe not individuals who have left brains on the sidewalk, maybe or maybe not, right? But I brought it to them to tell them we don't like when you leave brains on the sidewalk. We don't Absolutely. like when we hear gunshots at night. We don't like when we don't want to stop at a red light. We don't like when we feel the need to lock our doors. We don't like mm -hmm. when, you know, you are serving my mother. Yeah. Right. Like we don't like when you're doing, we don't like shots fired at dismissal time because the op got his kid at dismissal time. Like mm -hmm. we don't like shots fired at broad and market and leaving blood on the sidewalk the next morning during rush hour. Right. Like we don't like that kind of stuff. And to tell them that, but then guess where that conversation went, Solomon? It, it was, they looked, they looked like they felt the accountability because I went off mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In my own Berry Block way, right? With love in my eyes. So they knew I wasn't being judgmental, right? But then where that conversation went was when I was six, I saw brains on the sidewalk and I didn't want to be him. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about that trauma, right? And now let's get healed. Like, so it's a very multifaceted conversation, but it started with me being highly disturbed by the violence and me telling people, I don't like when you do this. We don't like when you do this. And so I think it's perfectly fine to tell individuals, your actions traumatize us and we need to be able to survive your journey of transformation. Because mm -hmm. if Miss Berry gets shot on the way to the store, oh no, not Miss Berry, nah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you care about me. There's a million Miss Berries out here. So 
I think it's fine to tell people that their actions traumatize us and we don't like when you do that. Now let's look at not just job, but career and relocation and all those things you've already talked about. So I appreciate mm-hmm. that. That takes courage. It also takes relationship. I didn't say that to a bunch of strangers. I said that to people I had already built rapport with and yeah. and indicated my intention. I mean, it's like people on your block, right? On the cell block. Like this, this, this is this is what we want and we need you to be a part of what we need, mm-hmm. you know, like that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So Solomon, three calls to action, three calls yep. to action, even though you've already mentioned a million, like we have just killed this whole calls to action. If people don't know what they're supposed to be doing, I, they wasn't paying attention. <laughs> what are the three yeah. calls to action? Go. Um, all right. First one is really, really important. As we talk about macro level, we started a conversation off with like macro yeah. stuff. Yeah. Here's a macro level thing you can do. You can support local community-based violence reduction initiatives in this city, right? Because people are out here every day servicing and making sure that our neighborhoods are safe. And the way that we support them, that we make calls, right, to city council. We make calls to the mayor, right? And we say, hey, whatever dollars you got, that's thing, it needs to shake and it needs to come down right now to my neighborhood, right? Because we need services and and be clear what services you need, right? So we need to we need to really support the work that's happening here, but we also need to you know hold those folks accountable in uh, elected uh, in elected office because there's a lot of dollars coming to the city of Newark. There's a lot of dollars that's been allocated by the mayor that needs to come. The the most disturbing thing I've heard, Leah, and I and I and I go to my next item is that you know when I go into a space and I ask for like dollars for a young man who's been harmed three times. He's been harmed three times and I hear that there is no dollars. I call your bluff Mm -hmm. because you show to me otherwise that there's dollars to do other things like concerts and parades with our public safety money. And so support the work that we do in community-based public safety initiatives by advocating to our our local leaders, um, politicians. The, The second one is really understand like civics right understand the role of again on a macro but also on a micro level like what city government is supposed to be doing right what law enforcement role is but then here's a kicker what are you supposed to be doing understand what are you supposed to be doing to provide safety within your own community and we and i think we laid out a few things right and so to communicate right we laid that stuff out to you really clear today so I'm excited about that second one, right? It's like really understand because like you, like like people who are probably watching this, they were like me five years ago. Like call the cops, lock them up, you know? We want them off the block. They can't hang out on a on the sidewalks. In reality, people are there because of a whole lot of structural violence. People don't have places to go. That's true, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody on the block ain't selling drugs. Because mm-hmm. ain't nobody would be making money if they were. Okay. Come on, like, you know, economics, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's real talk, they, right? That part, that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody's selling drugs. If you really right? knew, if you was really yeah. on the side, you would know. But go, yeah. Yeah, right, right, but, right, right. You know, they might as well go to Macy's and get a job. No. That part. Uh, that part. Um, <laughs> that part, and then, part the, yeah. and then the, the last piece, right, is to really, as we talked about this, is speak to your neighbors, know who they are. Um, and then I would say, really, if you feel like you know your neighbors and you, you, you're you're you about it right i would say is that you get to know people who are the most marginalized people those people who stand by the liquor stores every day right they're standing there for a reason because they lack resources and services i don't care what anybody tell you that oh we've been doing x y and z for the past 100 years it hasn't worked right what works is what you do Aaliyah, right it's what these brave courageous people do throughout the city is to have these conversations genuine conversation seeking to help right not seeking to 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 do whatever you need to do because your grant telling you that you need to do it because your grant is telling you to something right or your, you know or your government dollars are saying you need to meet these numbers like like genuinely have a conversation with the most vulnerable right because when you do what happens is that when you have these conversations with auntie on the corner you realize oh you have an auntie in your own family right who's just like her Right. She just may have housing and this lady doesn't have housing. Mm. Right. Mm. And so like, like, you know, I can actually cry right now because I 
there's so many people hurting um, in the city of Newark, and we've like we really privatized safety, and um, we haven't allowed the community to step into safety, um, and this is the result of it. Like for the past fifty years after the rebellion, we see, like this is the result of like privatization of safety, and we need to come together as a city, as a community, as communities first, right, and say like identify what safety looks like. And I want to be clear, safety is not arresting people. Safety is not saying no one can be on the corner. What safety looks like is that everyone's doing well, that they have the supports that they need so that they won't have to perpetrate crimes. You know, I don't get satisfaction for young men and young women being arrested for stealing cars. That's not satisfaction to me. There's no satisfaction when they like, oh, it happened on RLS. That doesn't give me satisfaction. What gives me satisfaction, which should give you know you the audience satisfaction, is knowing that we have thriving young men and women, right? Thriving aunties and, and uncles, right? Like thriving communities that should give you joy. And if that doesn't give you joy, I'm telling you right now, you need to leave my city uh, because we're changing. We are changing the landscape uh, of safety here in the city. But we need everyone to do it together. Yes. You know, there's no, you know, big eyes and little use here. Like we are all together because violence impacts. It has a ripple effect across the city. Um, if we continue to be divided because of our titles, positions, economic status, man, it's we're going to continue to see this this uh, violence increase throughout the city. So th th those are my three things. That's good stuff, Solomon. <laughs> That's good stuff. And especially just that whole last piece, just summarizing our entire conversation. Um, and, and you know, taking it seriously. Like, we're not cutting corners in this conversation that we had here tonight, right? Like, laying it all out and saying what needs to be said because it is so important. It is so important. And, mm -hmm. like, dare I say the wrong conversation is being had. Right. And like in pockets, you know, and so just like collectively coming together to have a conversation about the village and how we all work together to help people thrive um, is such an important conversation because, yes, it's very deep out here. It's very deep. And yes, it will bring tears to your eyes when you when you know it and you're not in the house. Right. And yet and yet. Right. You could be in your house. And, and your son in his bedroom, right, who, who plays on the game for nine hours mm -hmm. a day mm -hmm. is feeling the same pain that the one outside on the corner that you don't speak to is feeling. Family, yeah. like, this ain't just outside on the sidewalk. This is in our houses, our homes. Yeah. Like, the pain is, is real, and so we just really need to see each other. I feel like is the, the overarching piece to this. And being intentional and strategic, like you said. It's intentional. We, and we got to see each other as humans and yes. not commodities. Yes. Because that's what we see ourselves often as commodities versus seeing each other as humans. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I get closing remarks, but I just want to say, like, yeah. I cannot do this work right without my wife, my beautiful wife and my beautiful baby girl. Yeah. Um, and they allow me to do this work. Um, every day here in the city of Newark, and uh, I'm honored to to be a learning and growing husband and a learning and growing and father. So the safety that I'm trying to create is really for my my wife, right? It's for my daughter. So when she grows up, you know, we we can have a neighborhood, we can have a city that we can say is the safest city um, in the world. So that if, if that's your closing, I always do closing remarks as well, right? So yes, I guess your family holding you up, I salute them because we all have a support network that holds us up out here, right? This work is not easy and we all have support networks that hold us up. Um, but Solomon, I honor you right here today, obviously the organization, but you're here today as a Newark resident, as just you, Solomon. And so I honor you as a member of this village. Like you are an asset to the community. This community would not be the same without you. Um, I do say that to every guest because I really take every guest here very seriously. You all are assets. And mm -hmm. this village would not be the same without you. And I honor your journey of transformation and I honor the love the sincere love you have in your heart, Solomon, 
the sincere love that you have in your heart is my vibration, which is why you're here today. And like, I appreciate that vibration of true love um, for the community. And as you said earlier, the most marginalized um, that people often reject and villainize and um, don't share love with. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you. I honor you. I'm giving your flowers now. Um, yeah. And thank you for having this conversation with me. I think we, I think we did accomplish the mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if I went over time. No, okay, I, thank you so much. I've been already decided that about Sidewalk Talk, Solomon. Some of these conversations okay. are too important to have. I'm not going to cut it off. It's it's my platform. <laughs> I'm not cutting off important conversations like this. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and we and we will talk soon. Cool. Thank you so much, Leah. All right. Well, family. Well, well, well. Yes, throw all those hearts up, hearts up for Solomon. Um, he just, there's a lot to be said, right? There's a lot to be said. This is the moment where I'm able to kind of summarize the calls to action, right? Um, I'm not going to take too long. I could cut corners on this part, but the conversation that we had was a robust conversation and we needed to have it. Um, it was, thank you. It was absolutely necessary, right? Um, and so, he said the top three calls to action, though, his three that he kind of summarized with was hold elected officials accountable, not only for money, but also for services. He said, understand civic engagement, understand the government, understand law enforcement, which E had also said in the last episode, like we need to understand the governmental structures so that we understand who to hold accountable. Because if you don't know who does what, then you don't know who to hold accountable. And also where we fit in as community members, how we fit into that, that structure. And then he also says, speak to your neighbors, right? Specifically marginalized community members, whether they're on the sidewalk or in your home, right? But the most important part was about listening. Listening, listening to what safety means to people, listening to their perspectives, right? Validating their experiences, understanding where they're coming from. Also hold them accountable. As I said earlier, it's fine to hold folks accountable and also validate their experiences at the same time. You can do both. It's not an either or. Um, but allowing folks to define what safety means to them, um, to pick a lane, Pick a lane, family, right? And and but the lane that we're really talking about is like wherever your lane is, whether that is a, a mother, a grandmother, a provider, um, a police officer, an elected official, you know, a store owner, a crossing guard, there are so many opportunities for us to ensure safety of our own community instead of waiting on others or blaming others for not stepping into their lane, right? We need to step into our own lane, play our own part, and that is a running theme of Sidewalk Talk. Pick a lane, play your part. Pick a lane, play your part, and really listen, especially with these young people, especially with these young people, right? Instill leadership in them so they can go do the work with their own peers, okay? Instill leadership in them so they can do their work with their own peers, okay? Um, but listen to them because sometimes we're dismissing and vilifying folks and then getting mad when violence occurs but you don't ever speak to me. So I didn't see you when I shot up the block. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm not going to get into detail. Miss Berry's still certified, right? But all I'm saying is a lot of our community members don't feel like they are community members and they don't feel like you care about them either. So, right. So speak as Solomon said, and you don't have to use fancy words. It's not about fancy words. It's about seeking with a, with a pure and loving heart with a good intention and then listening about how you can serve. All right. That was all you guys go back on the episode. I'm not going to summarize all of it, obviously, but if you want to keep in touch with Solomon, um, who is a Newark resident, right? Then you can email him at brickbybrick973 at gmail.com. You can also email him about the North Community Street Team Public Safety Roundtable, um, which is my favorite meeting, literally, family. We be on a lot of meetings, but that is my favorite meeting ever. <laughs> and you all definitely want to be there. We talk about really powerful community issues, and there's like a lot of people in there. So you can also network, find if, oh, where do I refer people? Yeah, that meeting, you'll learn how to refer because you'll meet people in that meeting as well. So definitely email him for the link of the public, public safety roundtable. All right. So 
Again, like, tag, and share this broadcast for uh, impact. Um, again, my name is Aliyah Berry. Um, I work as a consultant with Seeds and Berries, where I do program development, training, and direct clinical services in schools, nonprofits, and the government sector. To keep in touch with me, you can follow Seeds and Berries on Facebook, on Instagram, myself on LinkedIn, um, also on my website at seedsandberries.com. You can find out more about my services. And then if you want to check out more conversations like this, right, um, on YouTube, YouTube season one and season two are on YouTube of Sidewalk Talk. We've had a lot of very similar conversations and different, like we've gone over a lot of different topics with very dynamic expert guests. And so um, definitely feel free to go hop over to the YouTube channel and watch some of the other episodes. All right. So next month, right? Because so then like when's next time, right? When is next time? So next time, all of December with the two sidewalk talk episodes are about policing. Like, of course, these, these, all these themes run together. These themes run together. Right. And so if we talked about, we're going to obviously start with community based public safety first, but policing is a part of that conversation and like how it needs to be. Right. And so we're going to discuss that in the month of December. Um, and so stay tuned for those specific dates. Again, Pick a lane, play your part. Thank you for your support on today and have a good night.